Welcome to the New Books Network. Good day. Welcome to New Books in History, a podcast channel of New Books Network. My name is Dr. Charles Cotillo, the Royal Historical Society. I'm a host on the channel, and today we are we are pleased and indeed honored to have with us Professor Jeffrey Parker. Professor Parker is one of the leading historians of early modern European history, as well as uh, military history, being one of the authors of the so-called Military Revolution Thesis. And today we are discussing his latest book, Armada, The Spanish Enterprise and England's Deliverance, 1588. Welcome, Professor Parker. Thank you very much for inviting me. Professor, uh, this is not the first time you've taken a stab at this particular subject matter. Um, what is new in your current treatment? <laughs> yes, I, I'm laughing because um, you're not the first person who asked that question. I started work on the Spanish Armada in the 1980s, in, in fact in 1982, when uh, a publisher, Robert Baldock, um, asked me if I would like to write a book about the Spanish Armada, and I said, yes, I would. And at that time, my graduate student, Colin Martin, now my co-author on the book, uh, uh, was working on excavating Armada wrecks. And I said to Robert, yes, I will do it, but only if I can do it with Colin. So 1982 goes by, we start work. He excavates on the wrecks. I go to the archives. We work together, and in 1986, I am invited to give a job talk, a job talk at the University of Illinois. And um, I talk about my research. I, I give a presentation about all the exciting new things that we had found, um, Colin and I. And at the end of it, um, someone at the back of the room puts their hand up and says, well, that's all very interesting, but after all of that, is there anything really new? <laughs> and I thought to myself, that is a hostile question. And so I answered, no, the Spaniards still lose. <laughs> and um, the whole room erupted in mirth and, and applause. And I thought, well, that's funny. You know, that, that was not a bad retort, but it wasn't that funny. And I found out as I went back after the job talk, um, the chair of the department walked with me and said, you know why everyone laughed? And I said, no. And he said, because that person asked the same question of every visiting speaker. Is there anything really new here? And you're the first person who was able to give a decent answer. So you've got the job. <laughs> so when you say to me what's new in the new book, you bring back an interesting memory from 40 years ago. And I have been accumulating data. The book that Colin and I put together in 1988 was not the only book to come out that year. 1988 was the 400th anniversary of the Armada, and probably 100 books came out overwhelmingly in Britain and Spain. And they produced a lot of very interesting new stuff. And uh, over the years, there's been more publications, publications of sources, particularly on the Spanish side, and so the point came where Colin and I both felt, you know, we ought to redo our book. And uh, the volume that went on sale in the United States yesterday, 7th of February, uh, is the fruit of that labor. It's four times as long. It has 200 illustrations. Um, they are in the text, rather than in gatherings. Uh, they're all in color instead of them being partly in black and white. Uh, and we're very pleased with it. We do think we have something new to say. How, if at all, has your opinion changed in reference to King Philip II of Spain uh, as it relates to the Armada in, uh, in the more than 50 years that you've been uh, writing about this subject matter? I have become a little less sympathetic uh, and at the same time, perhaps a little more sympathetic. Um, uh, I got the job at Illinois, and sometime afterwards, um, my colleagues foolishly, in my view, foolishly elected me their chair. And so for a couple of years, I was the head of a department of a Big Ten university. 
And I learned certain things then about problems that face all executive officers, whether it's a worldwide empire or a, a, a department in a Big Ten university. And one of them is uh, a lot of government, a lot of executive decision making is putting out fires. Uh, it's either deadlines or it's putting out fires, that there are some things that have to be done before a certain date. There are some problems that you need to deal with next or they will become overwhelming. And so I got a little more sympathy for Philip II because with a worldwide empire, he clearly is facing a multitude of decisions. I mean, it's draining and so I got more sympathy, but then I, I began to lose the sympathy, and I thought to myself, you know, the way to deal with this avalanche of information is not to concentrate every decision in your own hand and to develop a sort of zero defects mentality. He, the king becomes obsessed by taking every decision himself. He does not consult he orders and then he expects everyone to carry out uh, what he has told them to do, even though it's unreasonable. He very, very rarely changes his mind. Let me back up slightly there. The, there is a hardening of the arteries. Uh, Philip, at the beginning of his reign, does consult. He does listen. He does brief his executive officers in person. For example, in 1567, when he decides that the Dutch revolt, the revolt of the Netherlands, must be put down by force, when he will have to send an army there, commanded by the Duke of Alva, he, he, he spends four days with the Duke of Alva alone, briefing him, going over all the possibilities, all the opportunities. He gives him an enormous range of alternative powers. And at the end, he said, but you know, you are going to be on the spot. And if you can see that something I have ordered is foolish, then I authorize you to override it. By 1588, so 20 years later, the king has had a largely successful reign. Above all, he's managed to annex Portugal and all its empire. And he's ceased to do the consultation. Uh, the Duke of Parma, who is meant to command the invasion army, and the Duke of Medina Sidonia, who is meant to lead the armada from Spain, they both receive their orders by courier. You know, the postman arrives and says, here you are, your grace, here's your orders, get on and do it. And the, both of them say to the king, you know, this is never going to work. And Philip II just says, you know, number one, I am. I have the big picture. I know what is happening. Believe me. And number two, you don't argue with me. Just do as you're told. So in that seems to be just so foolish in the age of sale and the age when you know before you get the telephone, before you get the telegraph, uh, let alone the internet. That's just foolish. Nobody knows everything. Nobody has the big picture. And even if they did have the big picture, it's out of date by the time they, time they act on it. So in that regard, I have less sympathy. So yes, the view has changed. In part for the better, it's an impossible job. And in part for the worse, he could have done much better. It may have been impossible, but he still could have made a better job of it. So in fact, uh, even though you wrote a book with the title, The unprudent king about Philip II. In point of fact, uh, the nickname that he acquired in his lifetime and thereafter, the prudent king was much more of a backhanded or Janus face compliment. Is that correct? No. Forgive me, Charles. I don't think it's quite correct. He, he never has that name during his reign. And it's selected in a very bizarre and, and, and typically uh, Habsburg way. Uh, some historian, a man called Tordesillas, uh, Antonio, de, Antonio Herrera y Tordesillas, wants to write a, a, a semi-official history of the king's reign. And he's done it. He, he does it in three parts. And shortly after the king's death, he 
he, he submits his typescript to the um, Council of Castile, which is responsible for censorship. And this would be 1599, 1600. And he says to the council, you know, what do you think of my plan? You know, what do you think of the typescript? And they say, well, it needs a title. <laughs> we, need, we need to have a decent title. And uh, so Herrera submits a whole list of possible epithets. Philip the something, Philip the other, uh, uh, Philip the victorious, and one of them is Philip the prudent, El Prudente. And there's a little tick by the side of that one on the list, and so it gets into popular usage. It's a, it's a strange thing. It's never used at his time, in his time, uh, 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 and it's not meant as a Janus face compliment. It's just a committed decision. Okay, that's what we're going to call him. Well taken. Uh, what exactly was the Dreadnought Revolution of Tudor England? Ah, an in-joke. I'm sorry, it's an in-joke. Uh, in the uh, early 20th century, uh, Ad there is a uh, revolution, revolution in the, in the uh, design of British warships, uh, which is pioneered by uh, uh, Sir John Fisher. And uh, the first of a new class of battleship is called the Dreadnought. And uh, there's been, uh, I mean, you, you must remember that uh, uh, the advent of steam and the advent of steel as a medium for battleship construction revolutionizes naval warfare. It is never going to be the same again. So you get perhaps 50 years of experimentation as to what is going to be the way in which battleships should be constructed. Battleships that use steam power, battleships made of steel. So, you know, if, they, if they're hit, they sink, which wooden warships don't do. But they don't need sail, so they can go anywhere. And the first, uh, uh, the dreadnought is the moment at which everybody thinks, okay, that's it. That is the battleship of the future. And when I was looking through the records of the Royal Navy in the 16th century, uh, there is a new type of warship. Yes, it's a sailing warship, but it is of dramatically distant, different design. And it, the particular circumstance is, it, is an increase in sail power, but above all, a large increase in the weight of artillery ha ha on the deck. Uh, uh, something like 5 or 6% of the ship's weight becomes these big guns, I mean 40, 50 pounder guns, and a lot of them, mostly at the stem at the stern, we're not yet talking about broadsides, but it is totally different. And again, everyone sees this ship and says, right, that's it, that is the battleship of the future, and it happens to be called the Dreadnought, 1573. So that's why I called it the Dreadnought Revolution. It's an end joke, uh, but it's not, it's not idly chosen. Nobody at the time calls it the Dreadnought Revolution, just like nobody calls Philip, Philip the Prudent during his lifetime. But it is revolutionary. And the first ship launched in 1573 of this new design, the first ship is called Dreadnought. Uh, getting back to Philip II, would it be true to say that... Um his management style was uniquely his own, meaning most, mother, most other monarchs of the period uh, did not have this tendency to micromanage, and furthermore, that in your opinion, this management style to employ a 21st century or 20th century term was dysfunctional. Let me answer the first, second part of your question first, if I may. Definitely dysfunctional. And the larger the empire, the more dysfunctional it will become. That's to say, if you really are, are ruling an empire, and, and this, this is a term that we find at the time, uh, the empire on which the, the sun never sets. Uh, uh, Philip II has spin doctors. <coughs> um, usually uh, uh, they're not working on the Internet. They're working on medals, um, and they're making mottos for heraldry. And they, they actually get the, the motto, the, the empire on which the sun never sets. But once you're in charge of that, micromanagement is the worst possible scenario. But now the first part of your question, it's a temptation. 
<laughs> no, everyone, everyone thinks they can do it better than anybody else. So there's a temptation to micromanage in every manager. I, I, I would like to find the CEO who doesn't sometimes feel tempted to micromanage. Some of them do it successfully. Winston Churchill was pretty good at it at World War II. Franklin Roosevelt was outstandingly successful. Some micromanagers completely screw up, think Adolf Hitler. So uh, it's, it's, it's a temptation, and it's a temptation that you should resist. It's a temptation that Philip II fails to resist. Who would you, in retrospect, blame primarily for the breakdown in relations between England and Spain? Hmm. Well, it's important to remember that Philip II had been king of England. He marries Mary Tudor in 1554, and he remains king of England until her death in November 1558, at which point Mary's half-sister Elizabeth Tudor becomes queen. Philip loses his title, but he is anxious not to lose England, and so he proposes to Elizabeth and says, you know, I'd like to marry you. Um, and uh, uh, the queen sh shows no interest at all. But she is not married, she is childless, and the next in line is Mary Stuart, Mary Queen of Scots. But she's also Mary Queen of France. And so the last thing Philip II wants is to see Mary Stuart succeed Elizabeth Tudor. So he protects Elizabeth Tudor for the first ten years of her, her reign. It changes when Mary Stuart is, well, first of all, her husband dies, so she's no longer Queen of France, and then her subjects in Scotland drive her out into exile, and Elizabeth, in effect, imprisons her. And at that point, Philip becomes more interested in perhaps getting rid of Elizabeth, and he supports plots which are aimed to dethrone her, and indeed perhaps to murder her. Elizabeth finds this out, and is very annoyed, and spends the next, oh, this is 1568, 69, 70, she spends the next 18 years, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to have to start again. <coughs> We're talking in 1569, 1570, and for the next 15 years, Elizabeth tweaks Philip II's tale. She does things that annoy him deliberately. She allows Francis Drake to sail round the world, uh, uh, seizing Spanish treasure, uh, destroying Spanish property. And when she comes back, she knights him. She makes him a knight on his own flagship. Uh, she sends aid to the rebels in the Netherlands. I just talked about the Dutch Revolt, which uh, uh, gains strength after 1572, and Elizabeth helps. But the real catalyst of, 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 of um, your question, the point at which war becomes largely inevitable, is 1585, when Elizabeth decides that Philip is getting too strong and has to be uh, challenged, and so she sends uh, a considerable army to help the Dutch rebels, and even more provocative, she sends a considerable fleet commanded by Francis Drake, which sacks various towns in Galicia in northeastern Spain and then goes on and sacks the Canary Islands and uh, settlements in the Caribbean. And this is a challenge that no 16th century monarch could possibly overlook or ignore and I think from that point war becomes inevitable. And it's not just me, all the ambassadors at the court of Spain, and there are 12 of them, say the same thing. When news comes in that Drake's men have sacked Galicia, they say, okay, that's it. This is a declaration of war. But it's a declaration of war by Elizabeth against Spain, not by Spain against Elizabeth. Uh, wasn't uh, Queen Elizabeth somewhat um, ambivalent about Drake's um, expedition? I think in, in the text there is um, reference to the fact that she counter countermanded his or original orders to go to Spain and the Canary Islands. 
Not that one. Uh, she countermands the order for him to go and attack Cadiz in 1587. Uh, the, I mean, the, the paper trail is not complete. Uh, the instructions for Drake, uh, uh, the authorization for Drake, uh, not all of the papers are there. They may have been shredded afterwards. They may never have been written down. Uh, but we do know that in 1585, I mean, he, he's gone with six royal warships, six of these new battleships in his fleet. Uh, that's a fairly uh, uh, open sign that he has the Queen's consent. Uh, you could make the same point about the Cadiz raid in 1587, that he goes there with several uh, uh, battleships. But in that case, we do know that Elizabeth recalls him because we have the letters uh, which are sent after him. They don't get him in time. And he sails into Cadiz Harbour in 1587 uh, with the express intention of disrupting uh, the preparations that everybody knows are being made to invade England. Would it be true to say that for you, the death of the Marquis of Santa Cruz was not an important event in the history of the Armada? We're dealing here with counterfactuals um, because, you know, what would have happened if he had, he, he had been alive? Santa Cruz is a fighting admiral. He's been very successful in leading expeditions, large expeditions, uh, both in the Mediterranean and in the, in the Atlantic. In 1583, he leads a fleet of almost 100 ships uh, to the island of Teseira in the Azores, or Azores, Azores, as we say, and uh, uh, lands uh, an army and takes it over, um, sacks it, destroys it, hangs all the enemy, and sails back again. So, uh, you know, he's done it before. He's, he's put together a fleet, he's led it. Uh, but the fleet against England is different in two ways. Number one, it's even bigger, and it has a very large component of troops who are meant to be landed on English soil. And he isn't up to the job. He is not up to getting the fleet in order and keeping it in order. Uh, so if he had survived, if he had, uh, you know, he... By the time he dies, the armada is a shambles. And Philip II brings in someone who is an expert on getting fleets to sea, the Duke of Medina Sidonia. Yes, he's one of the largest landowners in the whole of Castile. Yes, he's immensely rich. But he has spent most of his years, most of his time since he became an adult, looking out the window of his castle at San Luca de Barrameda, at the, at the mouth of the Guadalquivir River, getting together the annual fleets that sail from Spain to America. And he always does it on time. These fleets are also over 100 ships. And so he's the ideal man to be sent to Lisbon to get the Armada in order. And by goodness, he does it. He arrives in Lisbon on the 15th of February, and the Armada puts to sea on the 28th of May. 130 ships. They get out of the Tagus without a single loss. Uh, and they start on their way. So he's, he's extremely successful. What he can't do, and what he says he can't do, is he can't command in battle. He's never been aboard a fleet. He's never commanded a fleet. He's commanded small armies. Uh, uh, so you need both. You need a Santa Cruz to lead the troops into battle, and you need a Medina Sidonia to get the fleet together. And uh, Philip II uh, has both of them, but the first one dies, and the second one, uh, uh, I mean, we underestimate the achievement in getting 130 sailing ships, large sailing ships, to sea. Uh, and Medina Sidonia does it twice. Uh, he does it in Lisbon in May. Uh, a storm hits the fleet, and it has to take refuge in Karana. Uh, but he gets it flit to sea again on the 21st of July, 1588, and 10 days later, he's off Calais. I mean, this is an extraordinary achievement. Why exactly did Philip II refuse to um, uh, have a plan B, as you term it, for the Armada? Well, there we go deep into the soul of the king. Um, he, he, he half... <laughs> He half has a plan B, 
um, he he says, you know, if you to uh, the Duke of the Dukes of Parma and Medina Sidonia. Remember, the the key to the plan is that the fleet sails from Spain, carrying a number of soldiers and an artillery train, a heavy artillery train for sieges. And the plan is that they anchor off Dunkirk, uh, which is then a Spanish port, a port under Spanish control. And there the Duke of Parma, commanding 28,000 Spanish veterans, uh, will board a, a, a set of bar, fleet of barges and be, together the uh, armada from Spain and the barges from the Netherlands will sail across to, to Margate on the Kent coast. They will land and they will march on London. So uh, you have that plan and uh, the king is pretty sure that God is going to favor the enterprise. I mean, why would God not do so? You know, he's trying to depose a Protestant. He's trying to restore England to Catholicism. It's clearly uh, a, a mission that has divine uh, uh, approval. Um, but he does think to himself, you know, maybe if they can't get ashore, uh, he has orders which he gives to Medina Sidonia and only to be opened in the case of an emergency, which says, you know, you could come back through the channel and land on the Isle of Wight if you can't land in Kent. So there is a sort of plan B, but it's, it's not very adequate. And, of course, nobody knows about it uh, because it's in a sealed envelope not to be opened in, except in case of emergency. Uh, but m my view is that he doesn't have a plan B because he's pretty sure that God will send a miracle. If there is some gap between ends and means, then God will send a miracle. I say that on the basis of endless documents that I have read in Philip II's own hand, which has this cult of the miracle, uh, uh, both in the Netherlands and in the Mediterranean and in all his military and naval ventures. He, he says openly, you know, and if, if it's not enough, then I'm confident that God will send us a miracle. As far as we're aware of, did the Duke of Medina Sidonia ever open an envelope? Uh, we know he did not because it's returned to Philip II intact. And, and there is a, a note. The Spanish um, officials are very efficient. Uh, and there is a little note in the file saying it's been returned sealed. Uh, he actually, uh, there are two sealed envelopes. One is uh, uh, to a man called Juan Martinez de Recalde, who is the um, vice admiral of the fleet. He's Medina Sidonia's deputy. And he is given a sealed envelope not to be opened unless the Duke of Medina fails or falls. And inside that envelope is the nomination of the third person, Don Alonso de Laiva, to command the Armada. Uh, but again, not to be opened unless Medina falls. And again, there's a note in the uh, uh, Spanish Secretariat uh, that it's been returned unopened uh, when Ricaldi comes back. But Ricaldi, even Ricaldi doesn't know what's in the envelope. And there is one point at which Philip II says to his secretary, you know, what would happen if the Duke dies and Ricaldi dies too? And the secretaries of oh, hmm, difficult. And they, 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 but they never proceed. You know, that's one of the endless avalanche of issues that uh, uh, come upon the king, and he never, in fact, solves that one. So um, it doesn't arise because Medina Sidonia does make the uh, the Odyssey, uh, make the, the the journey around the uh, uh, around the coast of Scotland and Ireland, and gets back home alive. So it doesn't come into play. But the, 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 the mechanism is flawed. Um, it, there's not much point in naming someone to take over. Uh, and the, the person doesn't know. And the person who's got the uh, commission doesn't know either. It's not very smart. Was the failure to attack Plymouth and the English fleet um, at that location a turning point? Again, that's a counterfactual, but it's a very interesting one. Uh, certainly, Recalde and Laiva, uh, it happens that uh, I discovered their correspondence uh, after I'd written the first uh, Armada book with the first version of the Armada with Colin. Um, one day I was in um, 
the I, I was in Madrid and a friend of mine phoned me up. Spanish historians are very very generous, and a Spanish friend of mine phoned me up and said, "Hey, are you busy this morning?" And I said, "Well, yes." going to the archive he said no i want you to come to this archive because we've found something and we can't establish what it is and so he took me down to the archivo historico nacional and uh went to uh, the office of the archivist who handled a series called military orders so orders of chivalry orders militares and i sort of looked at him i said you know why why, why do you want me to look at this stuff and he said because there are six boxes called curious papers and we don't know what they are, and we think you might. So I opened them up, and it's all about Philip II's plans to destroy England. And among those documents is a diary, a daily compilation kept by Ricalde, and letters exchanged between Ricalde and Medina Sitonia during the fleet action, the first uh, inter inter commander correspondence for a naval action I think exists anywhere in the world and letters between Laiva and Ricalde and they're all in the same folders these these papeles curiosos and this is answering your question Ricalde and Laiva both say we should have attacked Plymouth we had the chance we could have gone into Plymouth Harbour when the English fleet was at anchor and we could have destroyed it so why didn't they? That's easy. The king's instructions to Medina Sidonia are very clear, and that is you will proceed to Dunkirk and join hands, the phrase he uses, Darcelano, uh, join hands with the Duke of Parma. You will not stop for anything on your way there. So the simple answer why they don't go to Plymouth is because the king has forbidden it. Should they have gone to Plymouth is a different story. And the question is, yes, the English fleet is at anchor. It's gone back. It's, it, it went to the coast of Spain, the English fleet, Admiral Howard, Drake, his deputy, and the rest. They went to the coast of Spain, hoping to get to Corona and send in fire ships and destroy the Armada at anchor. But the wind turns against them, so they come back to Plymouth, having eaten up all their provisions, and lost a lot of men, and they have to restock. And it's while they're doing that that the Armada is sighted. And if the Armada had gone for Plymouth Harbour, as far as I can see, there are no adequate defences to keep the Armada out. But did the English have fire ships at this point? Could they have counterattacked? Because that's, after all, what destroys the Armada's order off Dunkirk a few days later. Did the Spaniards have fire ships? Because a fleet at anchor in a harbor is a very easy target. Uh, I don't think they did. Uh, so, th if you like, there's no plan C there. Uh, yes, they could have attacked Plymouth. But what would it have achieved? They would have destroyed the English fleet or they would have hemmed the English fleet in. But landing in Devon is not really going to achieve your goal, which is destroying Elizabeth Tudor, capturing London and imposing Catholicism on England. So it's, it's, if you like, it would have been a tactical victory but I think landing in Plymouth, destroying the Navy, would have been, it would, strategically, it made no sense. So that's a very long-winded answer, but it's a really interesting question. Actually, your answer provokes the following, which I didn't anticipate asking until just now, um, although it's an important question, I think. Um, were the um, land forces on the Armada... I think the number is 17 or 19,000 or 18,000. In your opinion, was that a sufficient number of men to have conquered England? No, and that was never the plan, you see. That's why Philip II thinks if he can pick up the veterans in the Netherlands, pick up the veterans in Dunkirk, then that's an army that can conquer England. Uh, of the 17 to 19,000 men, and, and the figure is is not altogether certain because some troops die 
uh, while they're waiting at Lisbon. There's actually quite heavy mortality as they wait at Lisbon. And they take on additional troops almost up to the last moment. And so the records uh, may well be incomplete. But let's say around 17, let's say 18,000 for the sake of argument. Of those, very, very few have been under fire. Uh, there are uh, two uh, regiments who have been stationed in Naples and Sicily and come all the way over to Lisbon, but neither of them have been in action. There's another group which has sailed to the Azores and back in the 19, uh, excuse me, the 1583 campaign. Uh, there are troops who have been on the guard ships which norm the convoy ships, which escort the annual fleets going between Spain and America. And one group is about 1,500 men have just come back from America and are immediately sent to Lisbon. And you could say, yes, those guys do have uh, uh, combat experience, or at least they're used to fighting on warships. But the, Armadas, the Armada troops are meant really as reinforcements. They're meant for, um, what do we call it, the teeth-to-tail ratio. They're meant to be the tail. They would have occupied the towns that surrendered to the Spanish as they advanced on London. And the teeth of the expedition are the troops in the Netherlands, who all of whom have had uh, extensive combat experience, some of them going back 20 years. Some of the men waiting to board the Armada uh, marched with the Duke of Alba in, 19, in 1567. So this is a very powerful uh, military body. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, already met English troops in battle and routed them. And it will later, they don't go to England, but they do invade France. And they cover you know, 30 or 40 or 50 miles in the course of a couple of days. So these are very well equipped. They're very efficient. They have great logical backup. Uh, those are the ones who would have conquered England. Why did the Duke of Parma not have his forces ready to join hands with the Armada in the first week of August, 1588? And does that failure matter? Because he didn't have a telephone. <laughs> you know, this is something Philip II never entirely gets. And strangely enough, neither does the Duke of Medina Sidonia. Medina Sidonia keeps sending Parma messengers saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm off Plymouth, I'm off Portsmouth, I'm off, I'm off Sussex. I'm off Beachy Head, I can see it over there. But it, it's, it's one thing to send um, a, a messenger uh, uh, in a little rowing boat uh, into the channel. Uh, I mean, the channel is seething with English warships, armed to the teeth, waiting to intercept messengers. They do get through, and miraculously the messengers do get through, but they take several days. So uh, the point at which Palmer finds out uh, that uh, the Armada is just off Ports of Plymouth is the 6th of August, and at that uh, early on the 6th of August, uh, at that point, he sends out orders to his troops stand by. Later that same day, he hears that the Armada is off the Isle of Wight. He says, right, start moving towards Dunkirk, because you see, he can't concentrate his troops, 30,000 men, that's a lot of people to feed. You need a lot of logistical underpinning to keep that force going. So they're distributed. They have their itineraries. They have their marching orders. But he needs about 48 hours to get them to the coast and another 36 hours to embark them. And the Armada reaches Calais on the 6th of August, the day Palmer finds out that they're approaching. And on the 8th of August, the English fleet attacks the Armada and destroys it. Or, excuse me. Uh, drives it away. So the reason Palmer is not ready is because he doesn't have enough advance warning. The reason he doesn't embark, or at least the reason they don't sail out, is because the Duke of Medina Sidonia doesn't give him long enough. Uh, he doesn't, Palmer doesn't have long enough to get his troops out to the fleet. Now, if he was able to do that, um, would that, in, would that have... Um resulted in the invasion of England, or that would still not be possible given the Dutch uh, ships which in, in the locations next to Flanders? Again, there's, there's a couple of questions there. Um, there's, there's a tactical question, the question of naval tactics. Uh, Palmer has a fleet of barges, but they are not equipped uh, uh, for battle. 
the Dutch do have a number of ships uh, lurking off the coast. They're not big. They're not big like the, the, the big battleships of the Royal Navy, but they're certainly big enough to destroy the, uh, 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 the little boats coming over. Um, do you, did you ever watch um, A Bridge Too Far, the movie? Yes, of course. You remember the scene where uh, a group of, uh, is it Canadians, tried to get across uh, in little boats and the, the, the Germans just machine them all, them all to death? Yes. I often think that the, the scene of trying to get the little boats out to the Armada ships would have been like that. You just can't do it. Uh, uh, you move too slowly. And I think uh, uh, Palmer uh, just just didn't, it, that was never the plan. The plan was always that the Armada would come and protect the passage. Uh, the Armada can't get in close enough because the battleships that it has are too deep. But the original plan is to have galleys and galleasses. The galleasses is a little deeper draft than the galley, but it's heavily gunned. And the idea is that as with the Tercera campaign in 1583, the galleys will get in close and ferry the army of the Duke of Parma out. And if they could have done that, then I think the invasion would have taken place. The reason they can't do that is the English fireship attack. Uh, the English have eight fireships and they unleash them on the Armada, anchored off Calais on the night of the 7th to the 8th of August. And although none of the fireships reach the Armada, not a single Armada ship is burnt by the fireships, it forces the Armada to break order, to cut their anchors, to buoy their anchors, and to flee uh, out of harm's way. And that's the moment at which the English fleet decides to move in, and it keeps the galleasses away from the shore. So the subsequent battle after the fire ships is the crucial element or aspect of the entire campaign, in your opinion? In my opinion, the crucial aspect, military naval aspect is uh, driving the Armada away from Palma so that there can be no uh, joining of hands. Dars de la mano will never take place. And to do that, first of all, the English break up the order of the Spanish Armada, which is... You know, is it, it suffered some losses. You know, there's been two ships which blew up. Uh, one ship gets lost. Uh, the galleys don't make it, but uh, it leaves with 130 ships and 121 of them anchor off Calais. So it's still a formidable fighting force. It has used this uh, uh, half-moon uh, tactic, uh, much criticized, but, you know, <laughs> the English don't criticize it at the time. They say, goodness, you know, we really can't break this formation. We can't get in among them. Uh, they're just too good. And so uh, uh, once they're anchored off Calais, uh, that once the fire ships break up the order, the English ships can get in, and what they do is they surround the isolated Spanish uh, battleships, and, and you know, six or seven English ships will just circle round and round and round until the ship is disabled. Only one ship is sunk, but two of them are driven the ground. Two of the biggest warships, two of the Portuguese galleons, are driven off, to, off the coast of Flanders, and uh, a number of the others are seriously damaged so that they, uh, uh, they're no longer able to fire. Why did the Duke of Medina Sidonia decide to return to Spain via circling the British Isles? He has two choices. Uh, once he's been driven off from the uh, coast of Flanders, once he's, uh, he's sailed by Dunkirk, uh, either he can regroup, reform, reshot the guns, and go back, sail south into the channel again, go to Palmer, and say, okay, here I am, board me, let's go across and do it. Or he can decide that with the English fleet, clearly tactically superior. He's just had a stunning demonstration of the tactical superiority of the dreadnought ships, ships of the dreadnought class. He can say, okay, okay, this is not going to work, guys. We're going to have to go back to Spain, and really we can't go through the channel, so we're going to have to go back the only other way we can, which is round the coast of Scotland, round the coast of Western Ireland, and go back to Spain that way and live to fight another day. And that's what they decide to do. 
would it have made a difference in terms of the battle itself and the reaction to the fire ships if Medina Sidonia had been a, as you call, termed it, fighting admiral? You really do like counterfactuals, Charles, don't you? <laughs> and so do I. I, um, uh, yes, uh, we come down to, to, to the nitty gritty, um, and that is that why do the English ships establish that tactical superiority? Uh, Santa Cruz in 1583 in the Azores is dealing with uh, a group of, of, of um, they're sort of, uh, they're Portuguese nationalists, but they don't have much of a fleet and they don't have the sort of military discipline or naval discipline that you would expect. Uh, the English do. So you can't say that, well, Medina, uh, Santa Cruz did pretty well in 1583. The year before, in 1582, he did spectacularly well in the naval battle. Again, he's fighting against uh, a rather under-equipped adversary. How would he have done against the English? We don't know because he never had to fight them. But we can say that the galleons that he commanded are tactically inferior to those of the English. The, 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 the tactic which Santa Cruz would have used, wanted to use, had used in the past, is boarding. Getting close to his enemy and sending the troops aboard his ships to take over the enemy vessel. And that works, providing you can get close enough to the enemy vessels. But in 1588, the ships uh, in the Queen's Navy and a number of the auxiliary ships, which based particularly their pirate ships. But they're very big pirate ships, some of them built by the Queen's own shipwrights. So there's about 20 ships on the English side which sail so fast, which can maneuver so well, that the Spaniards never get a chance to get close to them. And these are precisely the ships which have the large guns and the ability to fire them with deadly accuracy. And I don't think Santa Cruz would have been able to outwit them. Uh, he, might, uh, he might have gone for Plymouth and said, right, you know, this, this is an opportunity too good to miss. We're going to try it. Uh, if he gets to the channel, if Santa Cruz had been leading the fleet in the channel, he still would have, uh, uh, you, you would have needed to get away from the fire ships. You really, if you're in a wooden ship, you don't want fire ships anywhere near you. And so I think he would have withdrawn the fleet just as Medina Sidonia did. Uh, he would have reformed it just as Medina Sidonia did. But when the English ships are in among them and it's a ship-to-ship -ship duel, I'm not sure Santa Cruz would have done very much better. How did King Philip II react to the news of the defeat of the Armada? Well, uh, there are um, popular histories which were written about it. There's one particular one where the king is made to say, I sent my armada against men and ships, not against the wind and the weather, so deeply philosophical. But I found, I spied with my little eye, a document that he wrote in November 1588, so a month after he realizes that really <laughs> the lost ships are not coming back. Uh, the men who landed in Ireland and were butchered by the English are not coming back either. And that even includes Don Alonso de Leiva. So at this point, the king writes to his secretary. The king obviously prefers to write things down, which is great for historians. But instead of having a chat, uh, he writes to the secretary in the next room. And on the 10th of November, 1588, he says, I wish I were dead. You know, this is I, I, this could not be worse news. I don't know I, I, if God does not return to fight for His cause. I think this is the end of the world. And 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 he says, Oh you know, oh, let it be the end of the whole world and not just the end of Christianity. So he really takes it very badly, Charles. He's very upset. But then but then he rallies and uh, he sleeps on it and the next day he says, right, you know, I'm not going to... England, Elizabeth is not a woman. A woman is not going to do this to me. I am going to fight back. And so he decides that he will send another fleet 
against England. He will repair the, the damaged ships. He will build a new flotilla to replace the losses, and he will send it against England again. So uh, there is a dark, a dark night of the soul, uh, but uh, he comes bouncing back. It's a remarkable feat. Uh, but it clearly rattles him. Um, uh, just on a, a, a macabre note, um, there's a, a, a pragmatica, um, what would we call it, a proclamation. No, and we call it an executive order here. The king issues an executive order uh, uh, that you can only put up mourning, you can only put up uh, uh, black uh, drapes on your house if you've lost uh, uh, an immediate family member. And um, and that's interesting. You know, why would you say that? And this is where ambassadorial dispatches come in well, because the ambassadors all say the reason for that is that the whole of Madrid is in mourning. Every every house has black drapes on it. So many people have been lost. So many households have lost a member that every house was covered in black, and the king just couldn't bear the sight of it. And so he said, right, only only if it's a direct family member, a son. Uh, a brother, uh, uh, otherwise, you know, take him down. So, uh, yes, you know, it's, it's little things, those tiny little things like that that give you an insight into the way, the, the impact. Uh, the king clearly is, is shattered by it. His faith is shattered. He does come bouncing back, but um, it's it's a serious, stunning blow and, and uh, just shows God is a Protestant. Yes, or God is an Englishman. As they said in the nineteenth, like to say, nineteenth century, right? And in, in this, I, I mean, I actually did find um, a couple of people after the Armada uh, has been seen off. A couple of Englishmen do say, you know, so God is Protestant after all. They they, they make that um, they make that uh, uh, direct. I mean, the English the English also put their trust in providence. Uh, uh, Francis Drake, who we think of as a hard headed pirate, which of course he is, he's both hard-headed and he's a pirate, but if you look at his correspondent, it's it's full of invocations to Christ, uh, uh, God, divine favor, uh, um, I mean, uh, he, he almost could be a Spaniard, I mean, it's several words in every hundred, uh, 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 three or four words in every hundred uh, have something to do with, uh, 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 with, with God, uh, Christ our Savior, uh, uh, God will protect us. Um, providence is on your side. Uh, uh, you know, he he um, is an extreme example. But I think most English in 1588, uh, most English Protestants in 1588, regard themselves as fighting for God's cause. They are they are just as convinced of the righteousness of their cause as Philip II, uh, the Pope, and most Catholics. It's very interesting to see uh, uh, the similarities between them. Uh, that both of them, uh, both sides, uh, uh, put their faith in providence. Um, but if, if I may, there's a significant difference here. You, you, we, we talked about micromanagement, and um, uh, does everyone micromanage? Um, and I didn't take the opportunity to say, as I would like to say now, that Elizabeth is a very striking contrast in her management style of the Navy, uh, because when it becomes extremely clear that the Spanish Armada is heading for England and heading for England soon. Uh, this would be March, April, May, 1588. She summons Drake, uh, uh, Admiral Howard, who happens to be her cousin. Uh, uh, all the leading members of Elizabeth's government uh, are related to her in one way or another. Howard is descendant from Anne Boleyn's sister, uh, uh, Anne Boleyn being Elizabeth's mother. So she summons them, she summons Sir John Hawkins, the guy who devises the dreadnought idea, and Sir William Winter, who uh, often forgotten, but he actually has more experience of commanding fleets than anybody else in England, possibly anyone else in, in, in Europe. And she, she gets all of them together, and, and she meets with them in person uh, uh, to discuss what to do. Should we, above all, should we keep our fleet in the channel or should we send the fleet to Plymouth because we know that the Spaniards are coming and are they going to come to join up with Palmer or is this a, 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 a feint is this a fake, a Trojan horse to draw our forces off so that Palmer can launch a surprise attack 
in which case moving our fleet from the channel is the worst thing we could possibly do. And the Queen sits down with her naval advisors and they talk this out. And the only reason we know about this is that Howard uh, writes to uh, Elizabeth's chief minister, who's also her, her, the head of her treasury, uh, uh, William Cecil Lord Burley. And uh, we, we, have, we have his letter uh, in Burley's own archive saying, my lord, um, I have to tell you that I was meeting with the Queen and uh, I wanted to tell you that we're going to take the, ple the fleet to Plymouth, but she told me I wasn't to tell you yet. So I'm telling you now, and if you want any more details, Mr. Hawkins, Sir William Winter, or Sir Francis Drake can tell you, but I'm off to Dover to join the fleet. And I thought to myself two things. Number one, the Queen is taking a direct um, line, and she's listening to the experts, something Philip II never did. And the second thing that interested me was a parallel with Margaret Thatcher, because during the Falklands War, uh, Margaret Thatcher also consulted with her defense team, but she deliberately excluded the head of the Treasury uh, because she said, you know, whatever, it, it's in her memoirs in, in, in the Downing Street years. And um, uh, she wrote that she realized that the Treasury would say that every policy that she would propose was too expensive. No, we can't do it. It's too expensive. And so she excluded the Treasury from it. And I thought to myself when I read this letter from Admiral Howard to Lord Burley saying, I'm sorry, my lord, but the Queen didn't want to tell you uh, you're head of the Treasury. I thought to myself, wow, you know, there's, there's, there's a strange uh, 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 continuity between Queen Elizabeth and Margaret Thatcher. Not many people would make that parallel, but on that uh, 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 question, they did. Uh, we did. I did. And, of course, Queen Elizabeth is right. The only way... To do, uh, to do a proper strategy is to consult with the experts. And at the end, in Howard's instructions, there is that crucial phrase that, listen, this is what seems good to us, uh, but if when you on the spot realize that something unforeseen is happening, you may depart from my instructions. You can uh, forget what I said, do what seems good to you. And that's an extraordinary measure to take because... Um, uh, again, if I might allow myself a parallel, uh, in his um, history of World War I called The World Crisis, Winston Churchill, um, in his description of the Battle of Jutland, says that Admiral Jellicoe, who commands the Grand Fleet in 1916, Admiral Jellicoe was, was the one man who could lose the World War in an afternoon. And I often think that Howard was the same. Admiral Howard was the one man who could lose the Tudor state in an afternoon. Because if the fleet, the English fleet, had been destroyed, then the junction with Palmer will take place. And the Armada and the troops from the Netherlands will land in Kent, and they will march on London, and I don't think there's anything England could have done to stop them. Speaking about another Protestant moment, what explains the success of William III's invasion of England in November 1688 as opposed to the defeat of the Armada in 1588? Of course, it's a parallel that everybody in 1688 makes. Um, uh, the Dutch, the English uh, uh, are all looking at the precedents from 1588, and in particular, they're looking at the question of the wind, uh, the wind, the prevalent wind in, in the autumn of uh, 1688 is from west to east. So the Dutch, who are known to be assembling a fleet, are not able to get out. Uh, but the wind changes uh, in mid-November, and the Dutch just set sail, and they arrive in Torbay, uh, and they land on the 15th of November. And on the 17th of December, they're in London. They've taken over the country, or at least they've taken over the capital. Uh, so it's an extraordinary success story. What, how can we explain this? Uh, I mean, to begin with, assembling the fleet is easier for the Dutch than it is for Philip II of Spain. Uh, the Dutch have enormous resources of uh, merchantmen that they can embargo. They have an enormous number of warships in their, their fleet. Uh, Philip II has none of these things. He has to mobilize resources from all over his empire, 
uh, uh, Italy, uh, Spain, uh, Spanish America, they all make their contributions to the Armada. Uh, in 1688, the, 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 the commander-in-chief, William of Orange, William Prince of Orange, sails with the fleet. Uh, Philip II never does. So uh, he's able to do two things. That means he's able to issue orders immediately and get them obeyed. And he's also able to react to changes. Uh, it's a strange thing when you look at the, um, I mean, the sources are all in Dutch, uh, uh, Dutch and French, William III, often speaks in French and writes in French. But if you look at the sources, it's clear that um, William has decided that the, the, the place he cannot land safely is where the Armada planned, planned to land. He can't land in Kent, and it would be foolish to land in Essex because that's where James II of England has his forces deployed. So either he has to go to Yorkshire or he has to go to Devon. So either he sails north or he sails through the channel, and he sails west. And he says, well, we'll decide according to the wind. The wind will decide for us. And initially, the wind blows from south to north. I mean, first of all, as I say, it blows from west to east, so he can't get his ships out. But when it changes, it, first of all, it changes to uh, a blowing from the southwest. And so he starts up the coast of East Anglia, uh, aiming to land probably at Scarborough. And then the wind changes, and so he, he takes what he takes what in uh, uh, America is called a game time decision. Uh, he says, "Right, turn the ships round. We're going to we're going to run before the wind, and we're going to go west." And that's why he lands in Torbay, and he lands very very quickly. It's a journey that takes four days. So uh, uh, that's another important advantage over the Armada, which it takes between 28th of May and the 6th of August, even to get to the landing point. So there's another important uh, asset. Uh, the troops, uh, and he has everything with him. He doesn't have to do a junction. He has his troops, his artillery, his horses. Everything's on the fleet. William of Orange has everything he needs, and he's there himself to take game-time decisions. So, in my view, that is a staggering advantage. Uh, the English uh, uh, Navy, the Royal Navy, is anchored at a place called Gunfleet, which is off the coast of Essex. And it's great for following a fleet that's heading northwards. The moment William of Orange changes his plan and sails south, the English fleet is stuck at the Gunfleet because it can't get out round the sandbanks. It cannot follow. So William of Orange gets to Torbay, lands his forces, lands his artillery, lands his horses before the English Navy comes into sight. And then the Dutch warships turn to face the Royal Navy and the Royal Navy runs away. So there's no battle. And even if there had been a battle, William of Orange and the troops, the invasion force, which is very large, 40,000 men, they're already ashore. They're already marching first on Exeter and then on London. So all of these things were different. Everything that was uh, 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 turned out one way for the Armada turns out the other way for uh, uh, William of Orange in 1688. But I think the critical difference is the presence of the commander-in-chief on the fleet Understood. And on that observation, I would like to thank you very much, Professor Parker, for being so kind as to speak with us today. This is Charles Cotillo. You've been listening to New Books in History, a podcast channel on New Books Network. Thank you, Professor Parker, very much. Thank you for inviting me.